Profiles presented by INS Group, Insurance and Benefits. This week on Profile, Janet Gerwich, founder of Laura Mercier Cosmetics and founder of the Gerwich Consulting Group. Tell me a little bit about your background, how you grew up, where you went to school. I grew up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, my father was a retailer. He had uh, several shoe stores in Mississippi, and I always loved fashion. Went to the University of Alabama at a time where not that many women were taking careers very seriously, including me in those first two years. And then I realized what were my options. And I didn't want to get married, which was atypical. And I wanted to see the world. I was from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I'd gone to college in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and I knew there was a lot more out there. Mm -hmm. So I majored in business, and I luckily had a great professor who served as my first mentor, Wilma Green. And she could see how serious I was, and she helped me and I said, I want to travel the world. I love business and fashion. And she said, retail is for you. And um, she helped me and I got great interviews and I wrote Foley's department store here in Houston. I then got a rejection letter from Foley's. And in this rejection letter, which I have framed in my office to this day, it says, Dear Miss Gerwich, we at Foley's interview on eight select college campuses and the University of Alabama is not among them. We wish you best of luck in your future career. My father said, toss the letter, fly in, fly in person, go to Houston, and walk in and try to get the job. And so I did just that, and I got the job. And 17 years later, I was one of two women on the board of Foley's um, senior vice president and had a great year, career at Foley's. But I would have never done it without a father who said, toss the letter. I said, oh, Dad, they'll know it's me. He said, Janet, this is a form letter. They've written it to hundreds of students. So I never mentioned the letter. I called, I got an appointment, and luck, which is part of every success story, they hired 12 uh, graduates each year. One of the graduates had just got, that they'd accepted just got in the University of Texas Law School. My timing was good. I was there, I interviewed, and I got the job. What was it like working your way up? First job is assistant buyer, so you work for a buyer, and um, I mean it's a it's the fir it's executive first level of executive life at Foley's at a retail store is assistant mm -hmm. buyer, and even that was exciting to me because my buyer was traveling to New York and I was vicariously thinking that will be me someday hopefully, mm -hmm. um, but it was it was interesting. I also liked at Foley's you went to a class you. It was part classroom, so have you been through school? It was part classroom learning retail math, how it worked in a department store, and then being an assistant buyer. How different was your vision of fashion and the business of retail fashion from the realities of fashion and, and retail once you got in there? Great question. Um, initially, nothing glamorous. In fact, I had made really good grades. I was president of my school, and here I was in a stock room in Foley's downtown store, which is not exciting, with maybe a mouse, you know, and I'm on a chair in my little cute outfit counting damages, damaged merchandise. So, no, it, it lacked <laughs> quite a bit of glamour uh, in those early years. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the end, fashion is a business, uh, so I mean, business is not always glamorous. It's later that I got to really taste the glamour. What was the next, the next phase for you? Neiman Marcus had an executive vice president position, and uh, a headhunter called me and said the woman that had it um, had, had moved to New York to be the president of Avon and that it was a great launching pad and that really Neiman's wanted their next CEO to be a woman. So this would be in training for that. So it was just packaged beautifully. I flew to Dallas and it changed my life. Neiman Marcus definitely changed my life. Um, first of all, Executive Vice President of Neiman's, there's only one step above you, the CEO of Neiman Marcus. And we were so empowered 
um, if I came to visit the Houston Neimans and I said I think we should put Chanel cosmetics by the front door by the Galleria mm -hmm. and put Chanel accessories on the other side and my boss the CEO said okay and I said well, well who else do I need to talk to and he goes Janet it's us do it mm -hmm. so I love the freedom I love the autonomy I love the power um, but I also all of a sudden was in a global world. At mm -hmm. Foley's it was all very Texas. Neiman Marcus was all over the United States, but we bought the majority of our merchandise outside the United States. Mm -hmm. So I spent eight weeks a year in Europe, and I went from planning one day red apple sales to being on the front row of the Chanel show, or the Armani show. So from there, at Neiman's, you get this motivation, inspiration to to go out to strike out on your own. Now, take me through the, I guess the the light bulb or the idea of saying, okay, I'm going to go out on my own, and I have an idea for for a business, and I'm going to strike out after having all this autonomy and having a job, you know, one step away from the CEO's slot and security, if you will. And then, how do you do that? I think my decision was a little unusual, to be honest with you. Here I was at the top of the corporate world in retail, certainly luxury retail in the United States. I had the plum job. I was the executive vice president of Neiman Marcus. Loads of people sucking up to you. I mean, I'd go to my room in Paris. I would be, it would be showered with roses, chocolates, cashmere shawls, wine, you know. I mean, you're mm -hmm. a Neiman Marcus. But I had an idea. I've never had an entrepreneurial idea before or since, for that matter. But because at Neiman's, you're at the um, apex of seeing what's happening in fashion. Mm -hmm. And I could see there was a trend happening in cosmetics. And I didn't even particularly like cosmetics. I love fashion. But I could see that new names were starting to enter the marketplace that names like Estee Lauder, Coco Chanel, Borghese, Elizabeth Arden, no one was living behind those names. Now they said Estee Lauder was living, but no one had seen her for 20 years, so we were <laughs> never sure she was. But, but no one was really vibrant behind those names. Whereas in fashion, Calvin Klein, Donna Karan, Giorgio Armani, they were all living. Mm -hmm. So my plan, my business plan was Janet Gerwich one had no ring to it. <laughs> Number two, it had no credibility in, in cosmetics. I wanted to build it around a very credible makeup artist. And I needed one that had movie star contacts and supermodel contacts so I could get free press, editorial press. So I, I say when you have a big job, you have about five minutes that you have your fame because they forget your name quickly and they move on to who is the executive vice president of Neiman Marcus. So I quickly called the fashion magazines. Mm -hmm. So I called Vogue magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and Lauren said, who are the world's top makeup artists? Mm -hmm. And they each made a list for me. If someone made all three lists, I went to New York and met their agents and met them, and they were all male. And I wanted a female. I, did, I wanted to build a cosmetics company around a woman. Mm -hmm. And Laura Mercier uh, was Madonna's makeup artist. This was 1992. Madonna was at an all-time high. She was a Julia Roberts makeup artist. Mm -hmm. And she knew all the models. She wasn't, had no fame outside of that genre. Sure. Um, but the movie stars knew her and the beauty editors and magazines knew her. She had a beautiful melodic name, Laura Mercier. And she had an idea and that was to focus cosmetics on the skin on the face to make it look flawless. And she had a technique, she had no products, I mean she was a makeup artist. Um, and I said, I just walked in and changed her life. I said, we're going to build a brand around you. 